The Apostle John walked closely with Jesus during all of his earthly ministry. He was used of God to give us a remarkable, intimate, powerful account of the ministry of Jesus. The Gospel of John was written so that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John composed his Gospel to provide reasons of saving faith proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and offers the gift of salvation. He declares that these things are written so that you may believe. Last week, uh, Pastor Russell, as part of his message, talked about uh, the elephant in the room, and he dealt with a specific question in the text. Well, I want to start with the elephant in the room. Why is Mark sitting down on a stool instead of standing? If you've heard me teach before in here, uh, you've never seen me do this. So I thought I would just right out front just say why I'm on a stool. I hurt my back a couple of months ago, and while it is making great progress in the right direction, I thought standing and moving around for three services might not be the most prudent thing to do and might Probably could have made it through the eight, might have started struggling in this, and who knows, I might have just collapsed at, nine, at 11 o'clock, I don't know. I did, I did discover something the last hour that sitting for 30 minutes, when I got up at the end to pray, my legs were asleep, and I thought I was going <laughs> to, like, so I might stand up every once in a while just to make sure they don't, that doesn't happen again. All right, uh, we're going to be continuing in our study of the Gospel of John. We're in John chapter 7. If you want to have your Bibles ready, we're going to be looking at uh, beginning in verse 14 in just a minute, but before we do that, I want to ask you this question. Have you ever known somebody that tended to oversell themselves? Uh, maybe you work with somebody that just, you know, they were always talking about what they could do. They, they kind of the over-promised and under-delivered. You know what I'm talking about? Or maybe you did an interview with somebody and they, you know, you know oversold themselves and what their abilities and skills were. Um, and maybe you've had people try to oversell you. Maybe you're not the one overselling yourself, but you've had somebody try to oversell you. I know my wife is good at this. She thinks I can fix anything around the house. That's not true. I can't even come, I can watch a, you know, a YouTube video and give it a shot, but that's, you know, that's far from being a, a handyman. And my mom was really, really good at overselling me to me. Do you know what I mean? She was good at overselling me to me. Let me give you an example. Fifth grade, I, in elementary school, this was the year that you could be in the band, the fifth grade band, I guess. And I wanted to be in the band. And so I said, I want to be in the band. I want to play the trumpet. So beginning of the year, we went and got, got me a trumpet. And, and I started participating in the, in the fifth grade band. I shudder to think what a fifth grade band sounded like. But uh, I was in the band. And my mom would make these statements at home when I'm pl- practicing and playing. She goes, man, you're getting better. You're getting better. And you're doing so well. You're doing so well. And at some point early on, she said, why don't you play a solo in church? Now, I'm a fifth grader. I don't know that's you know, a terrible idea. That sounds like a great idea. Mom says I'm doing good. You know, more people can hear me play. And, and of course, it wasn't a church with this many people. There was probably about 100 people. I will never forget that morning when I played that, that solo in church. I think the song was Abide With Me. And up until the point till I actually got up, it still was a great idea because mom said, it, you know, you're doing great. You're gonna, you're gonna do good. I got up there. I got so nervous. People looking at me. I'll never forget, my legs were shaking uncontrollably, and I began to think, even before I finished, I will never, ever get up in front of people again in my life. Um, and I feel sorry for that church listening to me. Probably a few months, and how, how good can I be, right? Uh, but, but she had that ability to oversell me to me. And I'm going to come back around to this whole, uh, whole overselling thing, but there's nothing worse than finding yourself in a situation where people's expectations are not what you can deliver. And that's where I found myself as a fifth grader trying to play a solo in church. But we'll come back to that in a minute. Let's pick up our text. And, and, and where we are in our study in the Gospel of John is we are entering into Jesus last few months of his earthly ministry, right? We, we talked about that last week with, with the Feast of Tabernacles. That marked 
marked somewhere in September. And so the Passover would be in the spring. So he's entering into the last few months of his earthly ministry. And there's a lot of people that have a lot of expectations and ideas about Jesus out there right now. There's some that think he needs to be king. There's others that think he needs to be dead. There's others that are just trying to get what they can from Jesus. Some say he's a good man. Some say he's leading people astray. And there's a handful of people that are truly following him with their life. And so we think about expectations. And I began to think about that. And and what were some of the things that Jesus claimed What were the people hearing that had all these different expectations and and impressions about who Jesus was? So I made a list. I got my Bible out and I made a list of things that Jesus claimed about himself. And I've shortened that list, but I want to read through my list with you to give you a sense of what Jesus was claiming to others. He claimed to have been sent into the world by the Father. He claimed to be the Savior of the world. He claimed to be the source of eternal life. He claimed to be the only way to God. He claimed to be one with the Father. He claimed to have the power to raise the dead. He claimed to rise from the dead himself. He claimed to be the one to whom the Old Testament scriptures pointed. He claimed to be the supreme judge who will one day return in glory. He claimed to be without sin. He claimed to have all authority in heaven and on earth. He claimed to have authority to forgive sins. He claimed to have authority to answer prayer. He claimed to have the authority to authorize prayer in his name. He claimed to be greater than the temple. He claimed to be the bread of life. He claimed to be the light of the world. He claimed to be the resurrection and the life. He claimed to be the Messiah. And he claimed to be the Son of God. Wow. Did Jesus oversell himself? Did Jesus oversell himself? No, absolutely not. However, the people listening to these claims, they would have have heard them and they thought, man, this is beyond comprehension that somebody would make all of these claims. And when you think about it, somebody that makes these kind of claims, really there's only three things that can be true about that person. And we've talked about these three things quite often from this platform. That this person is a liar, that they're just making up this kind of stuff, I mean, it's easy for us to claim we can do things that we can't really do. We can just make up stuff. And you might have known somebody that (laughs) tended to claim they could do things they couldn't do. We call that person a liar. Or that person is a lunatic. They're delusional. They have kind of decoupled from reality. And their, their thought of what reality is not really reality. And so they think that these things are true, but in reality, they are not. They're delusional. They're a lunatic. Or what Jesus said was true. In fact, he was Lord. Liar, lunatic, or Lord. It's one of those. And Jesus in our passage today is going to address head on the source of his authority. If he's going to make these kind of claims, what's the source of his authority? And we'll see biblically why we can and should trust Jesus. And the title of the message, Can We Trust What Jesus Says, is an important question. For those of us believers, it's important that we can trust what Jesus has said. And if you're outside of Christ, I pray that our study this morning will get you thinking to the point of, yes, I can trust what Jesus said. Now, we need to kind of go back a little bit and look at our passage from last week to kind of get some some context. Because last week's passage deals, it just kind of leads right into what we're looking at today. So John chapter 7, we're going to start in verse 10 with some context. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, and remember, he had told originally his brothers he wasn't going, but really it was more of a timing issue. Uh, And the feast is the Feast of Tabernacles. And if you want to know more information about that particular feast, I would encourage you to go back and listen to the Beyond the Notes from this past week. Pastor Russell does a good job of explaining the Feast of Tabernacles. But basically, it was an opportunity for the Israelites to celebrate God's faithfulness those 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness. So after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, not at the beginning of the feast, but he came up privately. Verse 11, the Jews were looking for him and at, at the feast and saying, where is he? There was much muttering about him among the people. While some said he's a good man, others said, no, he's leading the people astray. Yet for the fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. And our first verse in our passage, verse 14, is also part of our context. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began 
to teach. So it's about halfway through the feast. The feast is a week long. So about halfway up, he shows up in the temple courts and starts teaching. Now, John doesn't tell us what he teaches. We don't have any record of that message. We have a lot of other of his teachings recorded in the Gospels, but we don't have that one particularly recorded. But John allows us to see what happened kind of as a result of what he was teaching and some of the the back and forth between Jesus and the Jewish religious leaders. And so we come to this question, or this really the the response, can we trust what Jesus says? And I'm going to definitely say, give you reasons why we can trust what Jesus says. I'm going to give you three reasons why we can trust what Jesus says. They're not from me. We're going to see these things in the scripture as we walk through. And the very first reason is that he was sent by God the Father. That Jesus was sent by God the Father. That's reason number one, we can trust what he says. And we'll get to the passage that talks about that in a moment. But I want you to look at verse 15 first. It says, the Jews therefore marveled. And, and, and when it says Jews, it's not referring to everybody that's there. John kind of distinguishes between the Jews and the crowd. The Jews are those religious leaders that are present listening to Jesus. A little bit later, he's going to talk about the crowd, and that's all the people that have gathered for the feast. Many have come from all over Israel to be a part of the feast. But when he says the Jews, he's talking specifically about the religious leaders. So in verse 15, the Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So the Jews are calling the credibility of Jesus and his teaching into question here. And and they were amazed, not just by what he was saying, but that he was saying these things and he had not been schooled in the ways of the rabbi. And we'll come back to their ways in just a minute and what that looked like. But I started thinking, what would that be like? Because they're call, they, they can't refute his teaching, but they're calling in to question his credentials. He, he's not been schooled. And so it'd almost be like if I decided to become a brain surgeon. I don't know if we have any brain surgeons in the, in the crowd this morning, but I decided to become a brain surgeon. I have enough money to set up my own clinic and I start doing brain surgery. And surprise, surprise, it's going very well. I mean, I have a great success rate. But all of a sudden, someone finds out I never went to college, I never went to medical school, I never did a residency. They're gonna begin to call into question my credentials. Yeah, he maybe had a few lucky results, but you don't wanna go there. That guy, he's got no credentials. He's got no, no, nothing to back what he's doing. And that's what these Jews, these religious leaders were saying about Jesus. You see, basically, the rabbis taught by quoting other rabbis. They would would quote precedent that had been made by a rabbi 100 years ago or 200 years ago. And so they they had this endless quotation of one another. And Jesus didn't do that. Jesus came right in and and just started teaching as if he had authority. Now, he's going to say where his authority comes from in just a minute, but Jesus wasn't quoting any rabbis. So they're like, how is it this man has learning? Obviously, they couldn't refute what he was saying. But they knew that he had never studied in their rabbinical school, so they tried to discredit him. And so the underlying question they're asking here in verse 15 is, can the teachings of Jesus be trusted? Are they the truth? And this is going to spark Jesus' response here and the back and forth that we see in our passage. And it's kind of the underlying question of the whole thing we're looking at is, can the teachings of Jesus be trusted? Is he a liar, is he a lunatic, or is he Lord? Now, verse 16. So Jesus answered them after they basically questioned his, his, uh, his teaching. He says, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. So let it be on your outline. Jesus claimed his authority was from God, the one who sent him. Jesus claimed his authority was from God, the one who sent him. And by the way, I mentioned on your outline, uh, I think it was just last week, we started distributing paper outlines again. And so, you know, those are ones that don't really help you a lot to get on your way out. You want to kind of pick them up on your way in. And uh, so just a reminder that those are available on your way and you don't have to try to think ahead and print them out or whatever. We, We make those available. So Jesus claimed his authority was from God the one who sent him. And Jesus didn't deny the need for external authority. He just wasn't quoting other rabbis. He's like, I don't need to quote rabbis. I'm quoting God. my, My source trumps your source every single time. And Jesus says something 
In fact, it's really an indictment on those Jewish leaders that they had got caught up in, in, in feeling like they were able to have this authority based on their own abilities and what they had done collectively. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But this is an indictment against those Jewish leaders and their endless circular quotation of a rabbi quoting a rabbi, quoting a rabbi, quoting a rabbi. Jesus says something very similar in the next chapter over. John chapter 8, verse 28. He says this, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and listen to what he says, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. Do nothing on my own authority, but I speak just as God the Father has taught me. And this is a theme in John's gospel that, that really it's a theme that Jesus brings up, that he has been sent by God the Father. Now, why did he, why did he emphasize this so often? Well, it's really a matter of his preexistence and authority. You see, if Jesus was this religious upstart, if he was just kind of coming up with his own ideas and promoting himself, then why should anybody believe him? However, if the one true God, Yahweh, sent Jesus, then what he says is true. And to reject Jesus is to reject God the Father. So application. What is your source of authority? When you speak, what is your source of authority? Do you rely on your own personal opinions? Yeah, people love sharing their own personal opinions. Do you rely on the popular opinion of culture as your source of authority? Do you rely on experts do you rely on the, you know, they say uh, in that? What are you relying on as your source of authority when you speak? You know, it's my aim, and I, I don't always do this, but my goal that when I speak, and especially when I teach, that I can say, my teaching, my words are not my own. Just what Jesus said. My teaching is not my own, but his who sent me. There's a challenge with that. Let's just be honest. There's a, there's a challenge because some of you are teachers in here. In fact, a lot of you don't even realize you're a teacher. But if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, uh, maybe you do teach in one of our ministries here. There's a, maybe you disciple somebody. Maybe you're mentoring somebody. Many of you teach. But there's, there's, a, there's a challenge as we teach the word of God that when things go well, we like to take the credit, don't we? And that, that applies to anything that we serve God in, that we like to take the credit. I don't know, there's just something natural about that, that we like to take the credit. Even as I prepare and pray, God, use me to speak clearly and effectively uh, on the passage that I'm studying. When that actually happens, it's like, ooh, man, I did a pretty good job. Yeah. And you have that same tendency too. And we have to be real careful to say, no, 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 no. It was Jesus. I need to point to, to him and what he's done in and through me. If I'm going to ask him to work through me, I need to give him all the glory and all the credit. Now, back to Jesus and his teaching. How could the crowd know that Jesus' teaching was from God? Verse 17, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. So let her see, those who humbly seek to know and obey God's word will know that Jesus' teaching is true. Those who humbly seek to know and obey God's word will know that Jesus' teaching is true. The key to knowing that Jesus' teaching is from God and that it's true is found in this humility of willingness to obey God and follow him, even when we don't know what it's gonna mean, what it's gonna be, or where it's going to lead. And that's what, that's what Jesus is telling his listeners is this, this humility of willingness to obey God. That's when we can realize and understand God's word is true. So why can we trust what Jesus says? Number one, because he is, Jesus is sent from God. And then num Roman num number two, he was seeking God's glory. I love verse 18. Man, I love it. And it's quite convicting as well. Look, read along with me in verse 18. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. John MacArthur states that there are at least two characteristics of every false teacher, and we see both clearly in this verse, these two characteristics, and specifically with the Jewish religious leaders. First of all, they speak from their own authority. They speak from their own authority. We already talked about how the rabbis love to teach by quoting one another, and it was this collective authority that they had where they would quote another rabbi. 
that had quoted perhaps another rabbi. They quoted these precedents that had been set. And that's how they taught. They had this collective authority that they had established amongst themselves. But secondly, the second characteristic of false teaching is they seek their own glory. That they seek their own glory. And that desire to take the glory was steeped deep in the heart of these Jewish leaders who were listening to Jesus that day. Most of them who had heard Jesus teach would never accept his message. They would not commit their lives to follow him. Why? Because they love their prestigious positions and power. They love the praise and glory they received from the people. They loved receiving that glory and to give up that glory for the glory of God, they were not willing to do that. John chapter 12, John talks about this. And I'll put it on the screen, but John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. John says this, Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogues. They, they heard the message, they wanted to believe it, but they were torn because they realized they would lose their position in the synagogue. And look at what verse 43 sums it up. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. That's a challenge for anybody. That are you willing to say, I love God's glory more than the glory from men? See, Jesus was different in his teaching. He, he, his authority was not his own, and his glory, he did not seek his own glory. In fact, we see this contrast with Jesus that his teaching was not his own, it was from the Father, and he seeks only the glory of the one who sent him. He's not worried about what people are gonna say about him. In fact, most of, of the response to Jesus' teaching was not positive, right? In fact, here we see even the Jewish leaders calling him in to question. This issue of glory seeking comes, comes up quite a bit in, in, in John's gospel. We go back to John chapter five and Jesus is addressing this issue of glory seeking. John chapter five, verse 41 and following. He says this, I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. Now let, let verse 44 sink in for a moment. Let that question that Jesus asked sink in. Basically he's saying, how can you claim to be a Christian when you're more concerned about self-glory than glorifying your heavenly father? Wow. Man, that's a challenge for every single one of us here. And, and I came across this, this, this phrase, glory compass, a little, uh, a few weeks ago. And I thought it was kind of, kind of neat because we all are born with a glory compass. And initially, the due north, which is where the compass always points, right? That glory compass is self. It wants to, to, to achieve glory for self. We see that in, in young children, all the way down to almost babies, young children. Uh, as we get older, it doesn't change. We have this desire to seek our own glory. When we get saved, when we repent of our sin and put our faith and trust in Christ, we are born again, we are a new creation, our glory compass changes, and now our due north is glory to God. However, we still live in this flesh, right? And we still struggle because we still like to receive esteem from other people. We still like to receive recognition from other people. We still like to receive praise from other people. We live in a culture that kind of says we, we just need to continue to always encourage and praise one another. And that kind of feeds that self-seeking glory, even though our glory compass has changed and our desire should be to bring glory all the time and everything to God the Father. I put on your outline, what are some warning signs as a believer that you may be slipping into some self-seeking glory? Because, of course, most of you are like, nope, I would never do that, right? <laughs> I think we all would be honest. If we're honest, we have that tendency to do that. First bullet point, you are more concerned with audience response than with kingdom or ministry impact. You're more concerned with what the other person is going to think, whether it's an audience of 300 or an audience of one. You're worried about how they're going to respond to what you say. And so that's going to drive your words. You're flipping towards self-seeking glory. The second bullet point on there. You're disappointed when others do not notice your effort. And it could be like 
effort to serve God, effort in ministry. Man, you've put in hours in, in serving somewhere. Maybe it's at the food pantry or the clothes closet or maybe the time you prepared to teach and, or maybe you spent a lot of time just counseling and helping other people and you're spending hours on the phone and nobody ever notices anything you're doing. And so you get disappointed. Maybe you even get discouraged because nobody is recognizing all the time and effort you're putting into serving. If that's you, you're beginning to seek slip into self-seeking glory. And if that is you, the next step is the third bullet. You make sure others know about the sacrifices and efforts that you're making as you serve God. So you begin to realize, well, wait a minute, if they're not gonna recognize all that I'm doing, Maybe I need to let them know what I'm doing and they need to know all the time I spent you know, serving in this particular ministry or helping in this particular family member or spending time counseling or you know, doing all that. So we, we begin to toot our own horn, so to speak. Again, if you find yourself making sure people know how much you're serving and working and ministering, maybe you're starting to slip into the self-seeking glory trap. And then finally, you constantly compare your acts of service and ministry to others. Boy, that's always a dangerous trap, right? When we begin to look at others and think, well, I'm doing more than they do. Look at all the years I've served on this, this committee and all the years I uh, taught the uh, preschoolers and all that. No, again, you're slipping into self-seeking glory. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. He says, whatever you do, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so if we're, not, if we're not bringing glory to God, there's a chance we're slipping into self-seeking glory. Number three, why we can trust what Jesus says. Number three, he speaks the truth. He speaks the truth. Look what he says in verse 19. Has Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? Letter A on your outline, Jesus reveals the truth of the human condition when he says, none of you keeps the law. This would have been a, such a pointed statement to those religious leaders because they had spent their lives knowing and doing and obeying the law of Moses. They, they had it down to an art. They, 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 and so for someone to come in and say, none of you keeps the law, this, this would have sounded incredulous to them. Like, how dare you, Jesus, say that we do not keep the law? Remember, the law was not given for salvation. It was given to reveal our sins. And the Jewish leaders, over time, had perverted the law. And, and, and instead of it allowing them to reveal their sins, they had perverted it to make it a means of salvation. Instead of indicting them of their, their sinful condition, forcing them to run to the mercy of of God. And that's where they found themselves. They were basically religious hypocrites, legalistic hypocrites. But that phrase, none of you keeps the law, just jumped out on the page as I was studying this passage because it's a great reminder for us today that every one of us is a sinner. None of us can keep the law good enough to earn our salvation. The law points out our sinful condition and our need for our Savior. Savior. And in God's great love and mercy, he had a rescue plan. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world who lived a sinless life. And at the end of that, that culmination of his sinless life, he went to the cross as a sin sacrifice for us, for any person that would repent of their sin and put their faith and trust in him and him alone. That's the good news of the gospel. Amen? And that Jesus said, hey, Jewish leaders, none of you can keep the law. And oh, by the way, I know you're bristling at that thought that I've just said. Let me give you an example. And that's why in verse 19, he says, why do you seek to kill me? Why do you seek to kill me? And again, Jesus knew their heart's intent. He knew that they were trying to kill him. John 5, 18, back th as far back then, he knew this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So even back in John chapter five, he knew they were killing him. We saw last week, John chapter seven, verse one, after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Moses' law was clear. The Ten Commandments, you shall not commit murder. What were they trying to do? They were plotting to kill Jesus, commit murder. They were breaking. So don't tell me you, don't keep the, you can keep the law. Obviously, you can't. But then the last thing we want to look at is Jesus exposes their hypocrisy. In verses 21 through 24, Jesus now reminds them of a previous confrontation he's had back in chapter 5 with 
the Jews in Jerusalem. And this is what began their death plot against Jesus when he healed the invalid man that had been basically paralyzed for 38 years. We looked at this several months ago in our study of of the Gospel of John. And they were astonished when he did that, not so much because of what he did that they would praise him, but because he would heal on the Sabbath and then he would tell this man to get up and walk and carry his mat on the Sabbath. And so this began that death march. So look what Jesus says in verse 21. Jesus answered them, I did one work, and that's what he's referring to, that that healing on the Sabbath. And you all marveled at it, but Moses gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. In other words, the Jews had come up with, when a, when a, a boy was born, he would be circumcised eight days after his birth. He would, if he was born on the Sabbath, that means he would need to be circumcised on the Sabbath. But to do circumcision on the Sabbath, that would be work. But the Jews had figured out, no, wait a minute, that's not work. We'll, we'll, we'll allow circumcision to happen on the Sabbath. So that was what Jesus is saying. He's using their own argument. But then in verse 23, if on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? He's arguing from the lesser to the greater. If it's okay for you to do a little circumcision on the Sabbath, Obviously, it's okay for me to make a man whole on the Sabbath. And so he's, he's, he's refuting their own logic, showing that they're the hypocrisy of their own logic. And he's also affirming it's okay to do good on the Sabbath day. And then at the end of this little section in verse 24, he says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Our culture today says, don't judge. But the Bible says quite a few times, It's okay to judge, but we better do it in the way that God prescribes it. And here Jesus says, judge with righteous judgment. And Jesus is saying here, essentially, you need to make the right verdict and judgment about me. You see, they saw Jesus as a sinner. They saw themselves as righteous, and they were wrong on both accounts. And Jesus is saying, you need to judge me with a righteous judgment, which I know you have trouble because you tend to judge on appearances only, which we kind of tend to do that as well. So he's saying, judge rightly. And this is a message for all of us, that there is no middle ground. Either you believe what Jesus said to be true, and you put your faith and trust in him alone for your salvation, or you question his authority. He's a liar. He's a lunatic in your mind. But there's no middle ground. And if you're outside, if you're here today and you're outside of Jesus Christ, I pray that you will seriously consider the claims of Jesus Christ. It is a matter of life and death. This is where I wish I was up and walking around because I would really emphasize that. It's a matter of life or death, eternal life. It's important that we understand that Jesus, the claims he made, if they are in fact true, which scripture throughout reinforces that yes, they are, and what we've looked at today says yes, they are, then this truly is a matter of life or death. Those of us in Christ, it's a great reminder that we can trust what Jesus says, that we can that he is sent by God the Father so we can trust him, that he seeks not his own glory, but the Father's glory so we can trust him. But ultimately, we can trust him because he is the truth. Amen?